welcome to Community Board 8 Speaks. My name is Monica McCain-Sanchez, a public member of Manhattan Community Board 8. Community Board extends from the east side to Roosevelt Island, and the east side is defined by East 96th Street to East 59th Street, East River to 5th Avenue. Tonight we have a program which is a part of a series of retrospectives. We're talking to members of the board who have served for a long time and contributed greatly to the success of Community Board 8 and of the City of New York. Tonight's guest is Chuck Warren, also known as Charles Warren, who has been head of the Community Board and head of many committees. And we'd like to get started. And thank you, Chuck, for being here. Glad to be here. So let's get started. Can you just tell people about yourself, other than being on the Community Board? Sure. Well, I can start from when I graduated from law school, where I practiced law in New York and Washington for about four years. And then I went to work in the United States Senate as the chief legislative assistant for Senator Jacob Javits, who was then the senior senator from New York. And that was a great job, and I worked for him for about seven years. And then I, I went to the Environmental Protection Agency, first in Washington, as head of the Office of Legislation. And then I came back to New York to be the regional administrator of Region 2, which covers uh, New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And they, we administered all the federal environmental programs for the region. And as you can imagine, in New York State and New Jersey, there are quite a few environmental uh, problems. Um, when I first got to the region, uh, I asked my staff, uh, what are, what's the most important uh, problems? And one of the first things they said was, well, we had one, every day we had one billion gallons of raw sewage going into the Hudson River. So I said, well, what can we do to stop that? And they said, well, you could always halt development on the west side of Manhattan. I said, well, what's my second choice after that? And so what we started to do is we started to, with grants uh, to the process of constructing two major sewage treatment plants, one up at 140th Street uh, on the river, Hudson River, and the other in Red Hook, uh, Brooklyn. And then we went to the New Jersey folks and said that they had to put the requisite treatment in. And now, years later, the Hudson River is much cleaner. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, that's something that I'm happy and proud of to have taken part in that. After I left EPA, I became general counsel WNET, Channel 13, our public television station. I did that for about three or so years. And then I took my one and only fling in politics where I ran for the state senate on the Upper East Side where I lived and uh, I, as a Democrat against a long-standing incumbent. And I, I lost. And after I, after I lost that, um, that's how I actually found out about the community board because I got to know a lot of political people and Robert Dreyfus, who was our council member at that time, he said, you know, I'd like to appoint you to the community board. And I said to him, what's that? And he told me about it. And I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And so I've been on it since then. And that was 1985. But in my real job, I'm an environmental lawyer. And I had the environmental practice at the law firm of Kramer, Levin, Naftalis, and Frankel. And that's a firm of about 375 lawyers, and we have major office in New York, office in Menlo Park, California, where intellectual property is done, and an office in Paris. So that's what I, that's my that's a quick summary of what I do and who that's I am. That's quite a lot to do. Have you, over the years, noticed significant changes in the way the board has operated? In some ways, yes. I think some for the good, some not so good. One of the significant things is that the attendance at the board is much better now than it was when I first got on the board. You know, you had a lot of members who showed up sometimes, but not that often. And then the borough presidents really started to look at that and say, we're going to not reappoint people with very bad attendance records. And so in the last, I would say, 10 or more years, the I think the attendance has gotten much better. And we get a 50-member board, we get routinely at our main board meetings uh, for in the 40s, and you know, some, and sometimes even close to you know 50, which is quite good. And I think that's a that's a major change for the good. I think uh, some of the changes that I would say are not as good from my perspective is that there's been a lot more division on the board. There always was division, but I think there's a lot more today than we've seen, and people don't tend to follow the rules as much and, and seem to more 
it almost gets down to an ideological uh, situation where if people are, let's say, against development and others are not as against development, then there gets to be a real battle and a war. And there's lately people have been complaining, I think, with some justification that we don't have the civility at, at the board that we really should have. And so I think, I think those are, you know, just looking at the big picture, those are some of the changes that I've noticed over, you know, over the years. What is the importance of a community board? I think the community board is actually quite important. And, and I really have enjoyed it because it really connects you to the neighborhood in a way that you wouldn't be connected to. I mean, I, we've lived, my wife and I have lived on the Upper East Side now for many years. It's over 40 years. And uh, we wouldn't know what's going on in the neighborhood if, we weren't, if I wasn't on the community board. And I think it actually, if people want to take advantage of the community board, I think it can actually help people who have problems with the city or with issues and neighbors and stuff like that. And so I think the community board serves, you know, quite a, quite a useful purpose uh, as one who started from no knowledge of it to obviously become, becoming very much involved in it. Well, I go to as many meetings as I can for the full board, and periodically people will come back um, having had a big problem in an organization, and they'll say, and I've heard this several times, that they didn't know what a community board was, and they're so grateful that because right. the board really will jump on some important issue and fight for you know, the, 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 the smaller groups. No, I think part of the problem is that it's hard. A lot of people just don't know what a community board is all about, and even that there is a community board. And I think that's always been a key uh, thing and I, uh, to how you get the word out. And I think that's something that we need to work on. And there's no real budget for that. But I think that, uh, I think that that's something that can, we have to continue to, to work on because like you've said, I had many people who said, gee, I'd never been to a meeting before, but this is very interesting, very helpful. And, uh, and I think people can get a lot of help from the board where you might not get it otherwise. Yeah. What committees have you served on over the years? Years back, I was on the Environment Committee, you know, and now it's Environment and Sanitation. Then I was, I've been on the Transportation Committee for many years, and, I've, uh, I, and I'm the co-chair, and I've been a co-chair for many years. I stepped away when I became the board chair, but I've, I came back. And now rules and bylaws. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the rules and bylaws. I, I was the solitary chair of the rules and bylaws for a while. And this uh, past year, we got, I got a couple of co-chairs who are great. So, um, you know, and it's, so it's a new thing. We have three of us co-chairing it. And we have a lot of work to do since a lot of issues, internal issues have come up. But now we're looking at the, things like our nominating committee for officers and other things like that. Well, do you find that with the effort to try to, uh, with the term limits and to to, um, have newer and younger people come in, do you find that has put more pressure on rules and bylaws and the work that you do? Yes, I think it will. I actually like the idea that new members are coming in. I think, uh, you know, people talk about term limits, but uh, we've really had a big turnover in our board over the last 10 to 15 years. And because the borough presidents have uh, put a lot of new people on, younger people, and I think we've got a lot of very good young members, and I, I appreciate uh, that. You know, it takes a little while to learn uh, about how the board operates, but I think the new members add a lot to the board. You were on this program over 10 years ago, and uh, it was a, a program about the Transportation yes. Committee. And um, you mentioned a common topic for transportation's request for special parking designations in front of buildings, as well as lack permit issuance need for increasing parking enforcement. In fact, there was an article in today's paper about uh, permit abuse. Has anything changed? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we're having something at the Transportation Committee which is new and different. We've always taken the position that uh, people are not entitled to have parking spaces set aside for particular buildings because if, uh, if it's in front of your building, then I want it in front of my building, and pretty soon there's no parking. And recently, we had a request for a building on East 92nd Street, and a lot of people said, hey, this makes sense. They should have it. This is a particular situation because people have to make turns there, and they come fast, and it's an exit onto the FDR Drive, north and south. And we actually approved it, and they said we ought to look at, and this is one of the things our committee is going to do, we ought to look at whether or not we just ought to uniformly deny them. So I think that's, that's, a little, that's a certainly a change from when we talked 10 years ago. The, 
The permit enforcement issue is an interesting one because Mayor Bloomberg did crack down on the issuance of permits. And we've had situations where we've had to deal with permits in certain areas. And we did a good job right on East 67th Street of getting rid of a lot of permit parking areas and working with the city to crack down on how they issued them. Because a lot of times you'll see permits just handwritten out and and the police don't bother even giving tickets. And so I I think it's a a continuing (laughs) issue and I think it's gonna remain that kind of an issue. And I think it's something that the mayor really has to crack down on and they really have to say, all right, there's gonna be one central place where permits are issued. We now have the kind of technology that you can always, you know, issue them that way and you can check on them. And so someone can come by with a machine and say, is this a real permit or is this a fake permit? And you could and and get serious about enforcement of it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just say the the last thing you mentioned was traffic enforcement, and my my thought on traffic enforcement is we will never get as much enforcement as people want, because if you think about it, the police department, you know, they're focused on reducing crime, which is I think everybody wants to see that, and our traffic enforcement units are actually quite small. And we've had issues that come up and come before our committee about enforcing, let's say, bicycle enforcement. And we had the traffic enforcement people come in. And they said they had, our in our whole area, and you talked about, you know, 59th to 96th Street, the, uh, you know, the river to Central Park. In our whole area, there are like five traffic enforcement people who ride around. We're not talking now. Now, we have to be, have to make distinctions. There's the people who issue the parking tickets they're separate from the police traffic enforcement people. And so those people cannot, the people who, that's, and that's a big issue that we want to, we, we've been looking at a little bit, but I think we need to look at even more, is those people work for the Department of Transportation, and those people really ought to have authority to go beyond just issuing parking tickets. They ought to be able to do other kinds of traffic enforcement, because there are a lot more of them but they're limited, very limited in what they can do. So the actual traffic enforcement people, it's a very small group for, for, to cover our whole area. That's pretty surprising. I, it was a few years ago at one board meeting, and there was a new commander and some new officers. They had sh- shuffled around, yes. and one of the officers had, I guess, came from an outer borough and was like shocked at the traffic in the 19th Precinct. Have you heard of that, um, about our precinct being, a, a community board area being worse than others with traffic? I don't think it's worse than, it's certainly not worse than the central business district and you know downtown where streets are much smaller and everything uh, like that. But we, we do have, we certainly have problems with traffic issues because you have, you, know, you have Lexington Avenue where there's a lot of truck parking and that's one of the things that we've been looking at, and the Department of Transportation is looking at how you can make spaces for trucks that can park and get them out of double parking and stuff like that. And we look to try and do that as much as we can if there are situations where there are issues with truck parking. And now it's gotten much worse, right? Because everyone orders from Amazon and Fresh Direct, you name it. And those trucks park for a very long period of time. Let's say I live on 90th Street. Let's say they they park near 90th Street and they just use that as a staging area and then they deliver all over the neighborhood. And so you have trucks that are just parked for a long time and we get complaints about that. But, but it's, it's very hard, you, you balance the interest, right? Uh, people want those packages and then we have to figure out how to deal with those uh, trucks. And the, we work with DOT and they're trying to come up with ways to do that, say truck parking areas that, and I think that's a good idea and I think you're gonna see more of that. A member of our audience had uh, submitted a question um, about the technical terms that are used in transportation, (laughs) which are actually kind of funny, such as the Barnes Dance and Pork Chop. So what are the designations, and are there any examples in our community district? Well, it's interesting. The Barnes Dance is named after Henry Barnes, who was a commissioner of the Department of Transportation in the 1960s. And he was a very innovative commissioner. And what that really is, is at all four corners, the lights are red at the same time. And that allows pedestrians to cross every which way. They can cross all all ways and even on the diagonal. We do not have any example of that in our district. 
I think there may be only one in Manhattan now, and that's downtown. But, but we don't have any. Now, the pork chop is sort of interesting. I mean, that's one of these things sort of where you have a situation where you have lanes that go this way and then this way, and there's like a space in the middle. And we have one which has been modified a little bit, and it was dealing with bicycles and traffic coming off the 59th Street Bridge in that area as you go up toward 62nd Street and stuff like that. And so we have an example like that, and then they, they've modified it a little bit. And that's really the only one that I can think of that we have in our area. Let's switch over to your role as a parliamentarian. We've never had a parliamentarian on our program, so <laughs> this is a great honor. Can you explain what that position is? Why is it needed? I had been the parliamentarian for many years, but they appointed someone to be the parliamentarian a couple of years ago, and I'm sort of the emeritus parliamentarian, but I get called on a lot still. And what, what that really is is that we're supposed to run our meetings under Robert's Rules of Order, which is the standard uh, thesis of, that governs most meetings. And that means, you know, what, what motions you can make, uh, you know, calling a question to putting an end to debate and, and all kinds of things. And so a parliamentarian is often important because the chair who runs the meeting, situations come up when people aren't quite sure of how to proceed. And then the parliamentarian gets asked, uh, all right, what's the correct way to do this? And, and one of the, one of the uh, uh, most interesting things that gets violated all the time, once you've called the question, you're supposed to move immediately to the vote. But then people, someone can raise a point of order, which is a priority motion. And, but more importantly, people raise a point of information. And what a point of information is supposed to be, it's supposed to be just saying, what are we voting on? I mean, just a, a, a very minimal question like that. But oftentimes, people use a point of information to open a discussion on something. Or to make a point. Or to make <laughs> their own point, exactly. And so that's when the parliamentarian's got to say, basically, that's, that's out of order. And so it really is to keep the meetings running smoothly. And as I indicated before, I think that's one thing that people seem to have a little more trouble with, it seems, uh, following parliamentary procedure. And our meetings get dragged out because of that. What are some of the long-standing issues that you've seen that come to the community board over the years? Well. When I first got on the board, one of the most important issues that still rings, I think, as, as one of our most important uh, initiatives was the R8B zoning. And uh, that was passed when I, you know, when I first got on the board. And what that basically did was say in the mid blocks of all of this, you know, between all of the avenues on the Upper East Side here, that you have a limit on height that you can go up. And it basically preserved a lot of all that low rise housing that you see today. On the avenues, you can build higher and, and oftentimes developers assemble you know, lots and they knock down the old buildings and build much taller buildings, but that preserves the mid block. So that was really one of the most important things that really happened here on the Upper East Side. The other one of the most important things that we're dealing with right now is uh, the advent of the uh, the bicycles in the big way. And um, under Mayor Bloomberg, you had Jeanette Sadek Khan, who was very controversial, but I would say a revolutionary thinker in terms of trying to get the bicycle culture really launched in the city. And many countries obviously rely on bicycles much more than we do here in the United States. And I think that uh, New York City's a difficult place for bicycles in many ways. But the Department of Transportation started under Jeanette Sade Khan to really emphasize bicycles. And so I think that's one of the most impactful things that we've had to deal with. And we, we've held a number of hearings on that that go on for hours because we have, we have a very big group of enthusiastic bicyclists. And we have a very big group of people who say the bicyclists uh, don't obey the rules, I'm, I'm afraid of the bicycles, I'm worried that I'm going to get hit. And then, of course, the bicyclists say the cars are the ones that cause all the fatalities. I mean, there, there have been, obviously, bicycle fatalities, but they are much lower. I would say that's one of our big issues that's still simmering around today because 
uh, the city is looking to put in more protected bike lanes. And that means where the bicycle does not have to get involved with the traffic and they're shielded in certain ways. And that obviously limits what, uh, you know, how many lanes that you could have on a street because then the lane is, you know, taken up by bicyclists and, and no cars can get into that lane. And so there, there are complaints about that exacerbates traffic. But I think, I think the focus is to try and reduce cars and reduce traffics from an environmental standpoint and in general quality of life standpoint. And I think we're going to see more of that. Okay. Do you see any issues common among the other boards in Manhattan or other boroughs? And what are the unique issues to our community board? I think that while it's a common issue, but I think we have it to, to more than other boards, I think the issue of development is, a, is very big. And, uh, you know, big buildings, we're, obviously it happens in other areas. And, and, the most, and the most obvious example is on the 57th Street corridor, which is not in our district, where they put up all these buildings, you know, over 1,000 feet tall. But development has always been a very hot button issue in, in our district. But I think one thing that's quite unique to our district is the existence of so many medical institutions. If you look at it, and, and public and private schools. So if you look at the medical institutions that we have along York Avenue, uh, you know, they're all major national institutions. Uh, you know, you have Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, you have Wild Cornell, uh, and you have New York Hospital, and they've, with Columbia Presbyterian, you have the Hospital for Special Surgery. I mean, they've all built you know, satellite kinds of facilities. And so it really, uh, I, I think that's something that we have that so many other places don't have in, in the concentration. I mean, there obviously are other hospitals in other areas, but I think we have a concentration of it. And, and we have a tremendous concentration of private schools, elite private schools. And they also come to our board looking for, to make, uh, you know, to, to build new space, to increase their space and stuff like that. And that gets into a, an issue, obviously, with the neighborhood. And uh, so I, I think those are, two, those are two things. The other thing is that I don't, while we're not, while we're not um, unique in this, I think we have a, a lot of, uh, in our area, a lot of uh, bars and, and restaurants. I mean, obviously, New York City has that all over the place, but we, we have quite a collection and proliferation up here. And that, that's also an issue with the neighborhood and quality of life issues. Those are the kinds of things if you say, well, you know, what's special about it? And the other thing that I think is special about us in a negative way is we have very limited uh, park space here in our district. And um, I think the statistics show that we have the least amount of park space per capita of any district. And so that's uh, the whole open space issue is such a big issue in our district. And, and that's, I think that's really uh, yeah, and some all of the, the things that the make us unique. The tension with the development that you just mentioned before. I mean, those, those are issues that every community board meeting is very uh, intense with all those topics. And when you mentioned the hospitals, I was just thinking, boy, I'm always hearing about the, the transportation right. problems right. there. I mean, it's... Well, York Avenue is a big problem. There's tremendous congestion, entrances to the FDR drive, and then there's all the traffic going to all of these medical institutions and hospitals. And uh, it's really hard to do that. And we've wanted a traffic study for years of York Avenue, and Memorial Sloan Kettering really put up some money for it, and the city's been stalling and getting this started, and we're after them to, to get it going. Because we, we really need to make a lot of improvements there. And it goes with the FDR drive. There are exits off the FDR drive that contribute to the problems, et cetera. Mm. There's a new question that uh, was submitted. Uh, at the community board, people vote you know, right. on resolutions for, against, and um, abstention or abstaining or not voting for cause. And you are first person I've heard of who's never abstained. Can you explain 
Why? Right, right. Well, the first thing to explain is that an abstention is counted basically as a no vote because you have to have a majority of affirmative votes to pass something. So if you're voting, if you're abstaining, you're essentially voting against it. But, you know, people abstain because they don't understand it. They don't, uh, they don't want to take a position on it. My view is we were appointed to this board to express our opinions on all kinds of issues. And I just think people are entitled to know where I stand and whether I'm for it or against it. And so I make it my business to understand what we're voting on and to express my opinion one way or another. And I do not voting for cause means if you have a conflict. And I have to do that on occasions when my law firm is representing someone before our board. I, I never participate in that and I never vote on it. Yeah. But I felt just my own personal view mm -hmm. and not shared by <laughs> many others, I think, that uh, I don't want to abstain because I think you're not, you're, you're here on the board to express your opinion and the public's entitled to know where you stand on it. Well, thank you for doing that. Now, we, we talked a little bit before term limits. They're being instituted for community boards. What are the pros and cons, in your opinion, on term limits? I actually haven't been a big proponent of ther term limits. I, I really don't like that. I mean, it's an eight-year term limit they're talking about, and I think, um, you know, it, there's a lot of issues to come up, and it's pretty, uh, I think eight years is, you know, fairly short. Um, so I think right by view is they're not really necessary now that the, we get such turnover on the board, uh, which is, you know, we have a lot of new board members and um, we have fewer older board members like me. And uh, I think, uh, I don't think we need term limits, but everybody loves term limits. I don't know that they solve much. And, but I think you're getting a lot of new people on the board and um, it takes a few years before people really sort of understand what's going on. And so, there'll be a fair amount of confusion each and each year there'll be new members coming on. So there'll be a big shift uh, mm -hmm. where now we get a few new members, but now you'll start getting wholesale slip, uh, shifts once the term limits go in. Now people say, all right, term limits allow new blood to come in easier and don't allow people to just hang around forever uh, beyond the point where they're useful. Now, I hope I haven't gotten to that point. <laughs> but I think you get the same result if the borough presidents are doing what they have been doing, and that is uh, appointing new members and good members. And as I said, I have two co-chairs on my Rules and Bylaws Committee, and they're both new members. They're both terrific. And I really enjoy work with them. They're, they, they're really good. And I think it's a case where it makes sense to have new members be active right away. When it was first discussed, I do remember um, some people on the board mentioning, and even some of the politicians saying, you're going to lose the institutional knowledge. Because certainly, uh, you know, with board members leaving after eight years, uh, not to uh, point out uh, any, anybody who's evil, but for instance, there, there are recurring issues with um, developers who may have done something and somebody can remember that 15 years later. Right. Um, so, um, th are there any other? Somebody said, uh, can't we vote in a secret ballot for our board officers? And I said, we used to vote in a secret ballot for that, but the borough president's office and the corporation council's office said, you can't do that. You know, there's open meetings law, you gotta vote in the open meeting. People don't like that. They don't like the idea of having to stand up and vote for one candidate or another candidate, but that was, you know, there are a lot of things that come up. Some will say, well, was this before the board before? What happened when this happened? And, and now, theoretically, the district manager might be able, if someone asked the question ahead of time, if someone sees something in a committee that they want to question before the full board, they can go to the district manager and say, what was the history of this? And maybe they can find out. But you do lose institutional memory. There's no doubt about it. So you've been in so many capacities in community board eight. Is there any one achievement that uh, really stands out to you that you, you did? <laughs> well, you know, there's a, there's a few things that, uh, I don't know about one, but there's a few things that I think that I feel good, you know, really good about. One, you know, one was when I was board chair, we filed the first 
197A plan with the City Planning Commission, which allows for people who are not government to submit a plan that can then get adopted by the City Planning Commission and the City Council. And that plan was to develop the old heliport site. And we started from the north end of 59th Street, which is the beginning of our jurisdiction, and going through 61st Street and took over that site. And it's now a park. Andrew has what? Green Park. And there's a sculpture there. And we have a lot of greenery there. And that's a whole new open space on the water that was never there before. And we, we had to hire a consultant and Judy Schneider, who was on our board then and, you know, really played a, a terrific role in, in getting that going. But I was, you know, I was pleased to have that happen and help speed that along. That was one thing that I think was, uh, that I feel very good about. Another thing that came out of our transportation community is that we urged the city to change the lights on the Upper East Side to have the delayed, the delayed greens. And I think they did that. And now, you know, when you go up to, when you're standing on the corner and the light turns red, it doesn't turn green immediately. So the traffic doesn't start. So if you're a pedestrian, you have that extra few seconds to go. So I feel, I feel that's something that really was helpful. Actually, for it probably saved some lives. Exactly. Pedestrian yeah. safety. Another thing that we were able to do was when the city built the 81st Street pedestrian bridge along the water there, there were a lot of issues with the neighboring streets and stuff. And, and there was a community group that got together and was very concerned about you know, the impacts on their area. And we were able to work that out with the, uh, with the Parks Department and uh, the Department of Design and Construction to make that work better for that local community. And so I felt that that was a, that to me, you know, was something good that we were able to do. And so I mean, those are and 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 one other thing <laughs> that that I think was important in its own way was that uh, everybody I think has heard of the Hampton Jitneys, right? They take people out to the Hamptons during the spring, summer, and you know, fall. And there were issues with local businesses because the buses are very big, and when they parked, they would, they would block the, the view of the stores. And so everybody felt, hey, this is really bad for business. So we were able to work with Hampton Jitney and move stops and do things that were able to uh, help the businesses, but at the same time, not inconvenience uh, the passengers or the, ha or the company. And that's the kind of thing that I, you know, I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of when you can work on something and uh, you can... So, you know, work something out that makes everybody feel like they got something out of it and they're not really, and they were helped. Are there any other committees that uh, transportation intersects with? Because when you mentioned, you know, the Hampton Jitneys, I was starting to think about vendors with the, the big buses on the sidewalk. I, would, do you interact with the vendor committee? Do you interact with Street Life? You know, not necessarily. We sometimes hold joint meetings where we'll consider an item jointly. We've done that you know, with parks, not so much with vendors. Um, and uh, we've done it occasionally with street life too, because there are issues that intersect with street life. And, um, and I think those are mostly the, what we've done, but, but occasionally other committees, small business committee, mm -hmm. we, we have joint uh, meetings because there are issues that come up under small business and 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 you know the, if it's a transportation issue that's dealing with small business, obviously we're the lead committee. But if it's a small business issue, the small business committee will, you know, on that issue, we'll, we'll have a joint hearing with them. So that's but even though it's a transportation resolution that comes out, mm -hmm. and so those those are the you know those are uh, what I'm thinking about now. Those are the kinds of committees that we would interact with. Over the years, uh, have any of the processes of the board changed that you feel made big improvements to uh, what the board seeks to uh, accomplish? Well, I guess, I don't know. When you say what the board seeks to accomplish, I guess there are a couple things. One, one is that uh, one improvement, I think, is that we've it's put a limit 
on uh, speakers, particularly the speakers of from the elected officials, because that's a segment, you know, it's interesting, that's a segment that we always have as part of our board. And um, some boards put it at the end of the meeting. One of our board chairs tried to do that, and of course, everybody, all the political folks objected, and so they went back in. So it's usually our board, we hear from the community, which is fine, and that's usually, they usually have limited time because they, you get a lot of community speakers. And then once they're done, though, we usually hear from the elected officials, but it's usually their staffs. And I, I, and I was glad to see, because a lot of times that can take up a lot of uh, your time. And I think one of, the, one of the issues that's always concerned me is that I try to attend every meeting. And I, you know, if we have issues to discuss, I think it's very important that we discuss them. But I think it's an imposition on people's time when you have situations that sort of just draw out things. And that's why I think the limit on the time for the uh, elected officials' representatives was a very good thing. But I mean, in terms of processes of the board that, um, you know, our, our board processes have sort of stayed the same, really. And I can't think off the top of my head of any real changes that we've made to, you know, I think we've tried to, I th one of the other things that I would say is uh, that we've done away with a lot of the paper notices, and particularly to board members, and everything goes out, you know, under the internet. And I think that's been very helpful to get us uh, and get more people interested in the board and makes it easier to communicate with the public and gets us to address issues easier than in the past when you had to rely on paper and moving it around. So I think that's one of the things that I would uh, look well, at. Well, that kind of actually gets in the subject of uh, digitization. And do you think the, the forced move into Zoom meetings was beneficial or detrimental? I think both. <laughs> it was beneficial, and I think more people could participate. And uh, we got, like, at our meeting this past week, we had 147 people on Zoom. You may not have gotten all those people to come to a meeting. That's a lot of meeting. I presided over a meeting over where we've had 200 in our transportation committee, 200 some people. I mean, you know, that's, those are big meetings. And, uh, you know, if people come, it depends on the weather and everything like that. So you get more people to participate that way. But what you lose really is like one of uh, our board members was saying they were appointed two years ago. They have never met in person, never met the other board members. You really the board loses that uh, interaction that you get when you're in person. And, and I think it's a little harder to, sometimes a little harder to deal with things when you're on the Zoom. And you know, we've been doing this for over two years. And, uh, and so it's, uh, and in some ways it's, uh, there, you get less interruptions because everybody is generally muted except if you're recognized. So that's, that's one thing that uh, does that. And, um, and I think you can string it out a little bit, but I think, you know, I, I think overall there, there are some advantages, but I think everybody would like to get back to in-person meetings, uh, you know, board members particularly, since uh, it's a way to get to know the new members and it's a way to, you know, talk to them and, and get a sense of who they are. And so it's, a, it's, a much, it's much different than when you just see them on the screen, you don't really have much personal interaction with them. And there have actually been many intelligent, accomplished people now and in the past who've served on the board. Who do you remember the best and, and what their contributions were? Well, it, it's interesting when you say that. A couple of people that come to my mind, and one is a woman I, who's no longer alive today is Edith Fisher. And Edith Fisher and I didn't necessarily agree on all things, but she was someone who very much believed in, in that the board had to operate in a an appropriate way, and it would, uh, and you had to make sure that everybody was heard. And she was very much a believer in following all the processes. And she headed what was called then the institutional uh, um, committee, and she looked at she looked at all of the hospitals and things like that, and all of the institutions that came before. And I think she was involved in many of the 
expansions that were the the hospitals and things that were done, and uh, a lot of a lot of people, uh, you know, thought uh, that she pushed that too much. But I think she I think she accomplished quite a bit. And um, another woman who's not on our board who became a good friend of mine and still a friend is Hetty White, who I think accomplished a lot. She was the chair of our board, and she was always a voice of reason, and she brought clear thinking to things, and I think she's a voice for small businesses, and uh, I think she helped a lot of small businesses over the years uh, and, and things like that. And, uh, and one of my present board members who... Uh, been on a long time that I want to just call attention to is Barry Schneider. And Barry's, you know, been someone I've worked with very closely, and I think he's someone that has contributed a tremendous amount. He was co-chair uh, of the Transportation Committee with me, and he's, he was involved in uh, working on, they had a, they had sort of a, uh, a committee that uh, tried to look at all the lesser bridges and, and call attention to them and, and stuff. And he was very involved then. He's been very involved in the community over the years and on the 19th Precinct uh, Council. And uh, he's contributed a lot and, and helped a lot to advance things on the Transportation Committee. And uh, so those are people who sort of come to mind when you say who, there've been a lot of, you know, there've been a lot of people Henry Stern was on our board, the former Parks Commissioner, for a oh. very short time in the in the interim between when he wasn't Park Commissioner, then he became Park Commissioner again. <laughs> and so he was on the board, but he was not for very long. Were there any board members you, you think of who are influential on the way you view issues? Not really. I, I listen to arguments, certainly, but... Uh, I believe I don't believe in talking to people about issues outside of board meetings. That's just my own way of doing it. I think we ought to listen to the arguments at the board meetings, but I don't get on the phone and strategize with people outside of board meetings. It's just something I've never done. I mean, a number, a lot of people do, but I just, I just don't do it. Your term as a full board member will be ending in a few years. Do you plan on staying involved with the community board in some capacity? Well, you know, I, obviously I'm interested in the community issues, and so I'll think of ways where I can stay involved. I'll have to see how that goes. And, uh, you know, you can always be a public member on some things, and I'm, maybe I'll be a public member of transportation or something like that since I know a little bit about it. And I've been chair of the Transportation Committee for on and off for a very long time. So, uh, Any other community groups you've been affiliated yeah, with? Yes. I'm on the board of Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, which is a social services agency. They're located on you know 70th Street in our area, and uh, they do a lot of great work. I chair the board of something called Settlement Housing Fund, which is a nonprofit group that uh, provides low and moderate income housing throughout the New York metropolitan area. And I'm also chairing the board of something called New Settlement Apartments, which delivers social services in the Bronx. I'm also on the board of the New York League of Conservation Voters, which is a, an environmental group that looks to the election of environmentally friendly candidates, and I chaired that board for about six years. I was on the board, and I'm on the advisory board of Civitas, which is our local civic organization that uh, gets involved in all kinds of Upper East Side issues here, and on the advisory board of the River Keeper, which is another environmental organization that's looking to preserve the Hudson River and, and help things, you know, in that regard. And so those are some of the things that I'm involved in. The other thing is, which is a quasi-governmental thing that I'm involved in, I'm on the Harbor Estuary Policy Committee of the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program. That's a policy committee to try to clean up New York Harbor and deal with issues on New York Harbor. And there have agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Corps of Engineers, the uh, New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and some local communities. I represent as a citizens advisory group. And so those are some of the things that I'm involved in. That's pretty impressive. I'm my local co-op board also. Just oh, my gosh. <laughs> in my spare time. If you could suggest changes to the operation of the community board, what would they be? If you had a magic wand. Well, that's a tough question. We just 
passed a decorum clause that we in our bylaws at our last meeting just on Wednesday. And um, one of the changes I would like to see is I would like to see issues debated on the merits without uh, all of the, uh, I would say, extracurricular stuff that goes on. And, you know, that's human nature to a certain extent, obviously, but I think I've never, I've never attacked anyone in all the years I've been on the board uh, for their position or their point of view. And I think everyone needs to, needs to be treated in a courteous uh, way, and that particularly applicants, and sometimes people do not do that at the board. And I, I really, that's really one of the things that uh, I find very troubling. And so if I could wave a wand, I would have people, it's probably wishful thinking, try and behave you know, appropriately, and particularly to the people who come before us and the applicants come before us. And, um, and I, would also, I would also like to uh, see if we could, if there's a way that the community board be, could, could have more funds to become better known throughout the community. If I could, you know, I think if that, I think that would help us because people would realize that the community board can do things to really help you if you have a problem with the city or you need intervention with the city. And, uh, and most people don't come to the community board because they don't even know about it. So those, I mean, those are some of the things. It's hard to, it's hard to say how to do it because it's, you know, we're a quasi city agency. We are a city agency. And um, I think that uh, more funding for the community board would be appropriate. But there's always been, you know, some, some administrations have not liked the idea of community boards. Uh, but I really think it's a, I really think it's an interesting idea. If you think of all gov all problems are local, and you can't get any more local than the community board mm -hmm. and delivering basic services. And uh, and I think in a city like this, it's helpful to have that connection. Years ago, you had places like Tammany Hall. If you had a problem, right, you went to your local political leader. But the, those places don't exist. They don't have that same kind of clout. So now we have the community board, and the, the issue is how effective can we be? And I think, and I think um, there probably are ways to make us more effective. You don't want to give us an absolute veto because that I think on certain things. But I do think, and 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 I do think we could. That there's some government agencies that could uh, pay more attention to what we say, even though they have the ultimate decision. And maybe if I could wave a wand, I would say to put in some procedures that would require government agencies to really more seriously consider what we're saying without giving us, you know, a complete veto, because I think that wouldn't work, you know, because in the end, the, the government has to decide. Yeah. Chuck, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And thank you for all the years you've dedicated to the community board. You have been really a, a true asset and everyone respects you and thanks everyone for joining us and if you want to get involved with the community board it's very easy go to cbam.com and the list of the meetings are there for the different committees and the full board meeting and other resources there's also a phone number you can call the board out office ask them questions and uh, we hope to see you at a community board meeting maybe in person in the future thank you <music>